Turn to page 140 in Sim Shalom, um, or the page that Rabbi Zeph is pulling up on the screen for, screen for us, to say these words, Hashkiveinu Adonai Eloheinu L'Shalom, help us, God, to lie down in peace. And especially in this moment in our world when there are so many things that could keep us awake, keep us awake at night, yearning for peace. We say this bracha as, we, as the night begins to fall um, with a deep, deep hope that we can have, at least for a moment tonight, some peace, some sense of shelter, some sense of tranquility in our lives. Page 141. <laughs> We turn to the Chatsi Kaddish. Amen. <laughs> Continue with the silent Amida.
Turn to Kaddish Shalem up on the screen or on page 149 in Sim Shalom. Yitkadal Yitkada Shemir Abba. And Mazi Brakir Tevi Amlich Machute, Bahaye Hamil Mechon of Kaye, the Hobbit Israel, Badalav is man Kariv Vimru. Amen. Arach Bisha Bahit Parvitraman, Vitna Savit, Hadar Vita Levital, Shmedikurisha, Breath. The Elamin Kober Hatav, Shirata, Kushbahatav and Ahamata, the Amiran Be Alma Vimru. Amen. It Kabal Flotan, about the Honda Holyus or Alpodom of a Honda Vishmaya Vimru. Amen. Yes, the Marava Minshamaya, the Hayim Alinu Bell call Yisrael Vimru. Amen. O Se Shalom Bimrama, who ya say Shalom, Alinu Bell call Yisrael, Bell call your spate, Val Vimru. Amen. I invite you to rise in your places as you're able for Alinu, page 150 and Sim Shalom, or up on the screen. And since, uh, well, for, t for two reasons. One, because we have two different Sidorim or maybe multiple different Sidorim that we're praying out of. And also because we're all muted, um, I want to invite us to just imagine the cacophony of uh, liturgy that might swirl around us as we say each to our own, the liturgy that resonates in our hearts. Um, but I'm going to be davening out of Sim Shalom. Alinu l'shabayach l'adon hakol, latit g'dula l'yotzer b'rishit, shelo asanu k'goye haratzot, velo asamanu k'mishpachot ha'adama, Shalom, Sam Chokinu Kahem, Vegor Alinu Kecholam Monam, Vanach Nu Korim, Umishtahavim Modim, Leaf Ne Malach Malche Hamalachim, Hakadosh Parahu Shem. I'll kinnik Valachadon Elohim. Kakatu vatora tacha Adonai im loch leolam vad Vememar vehaya Adonai Vemelech al koh haaretz Vayom ha'ahu Vayom ha'ahu Iyya Adonai achad Ushamo 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 Echad Warner's Scottish is on page 151 or up on the screen. Invite all those in mourning or observing the art site to rise as you're able. Yitzkadal, Yitzkadash, Shame Raba, Amen. Be Alma, Divra, Kirute, Be Alich, Malchute, Bechayechon, Uvyomechon, Uvchaye, the whole Beit, Yisrael, Ba Agala, Uvizman, Kariv, the Imru, Amen. Hadar, <laughs> Yehe Shalama Rabba Min Shalaya, Bechayim Aleinu Ve'alko Yisrael, Ru Amen. Ose Shalom Bimromav, Hu Ya'ase Shalom, Nu Ve'alko Yisrael, Ve'alko Yoshvei Tevel, Ve'imru Amen. Yashe Koach. Erev to everybody. It's good to see everybody here today. And um, just a word of Torah before we begin our meeting, that um, this is the Shabbat, this is the week that we are reading Parashat Shlach Lecha. 
And Parashat Shlach Lecha is a turning point in Torah where the people think they're about to enter the promised land and they're all ready. They can see it. It's right there in front of them. And then they, depending, we don't have to go into what happens, but they say they lose faith in their ability to go into the land and they end up with this decree that they can't go into the land. Not yet, not them, not that generation. They're not the ones who are gonna be able to go into the land. They have to wander in the wilderness some more. And one of the amazing things about this Torah portion is that, the, is that it goes on from there. In other words, it's not like life stops suddenly. The people, the people cry, they're upset that they're not gonna get into go, go to the land yet. And yet it turns immediately, the Torah turns to what's going to happen when people do go into the land, when their descendants are gonna go into the land, when the people in the future are gonna go into the land, how are they going to act? How are they going to behave? So this moment that could be a moment of stopping where we see like the dream is unfulfilled, instead is seen as a moment of a dream deferred. The people are gonna go into the land, but it's not gonna be that generation. They're not gonna see the fulfillment of the dream. The people after them are going to see it. And there's something really powerful about uh, a community of people believing in a dream so much that they can believe it even when it's gonna be denied to them. Even when the people they know, the people they love, the people who are alive with them are not going to see the end of the dream. And in you know, in, in writing our synagogue's history, when uh, I believe it was at the, perhaps the 50th uh, anniversary uh, of the founding of the synagogue, and we pitched, there was a book published called um, From Dream to Reality uh, about the founding of the synagogue and the building of the building and how amazing that was. And the thing was though, that I think that it was a little premature because the dream of the people who founded the synagogue was creating this amazing vital community that would be able to overcome many challenges and be able to survive into a future that they themselves were not going to be able to see. And that point was not reached at 50 years because then, thank God, a lot of our founders were still around. Um, and it's really only recently as the generation of our founders has passed from this earth that are certainly begun to, the, we've really seen the fulfillment of the dream. The fulfillment of the dream is that we go on. The fulfillment of the dream is that we face challenges, we face changes, we actually change our, our whole definition of what is community and who we wanna welcome in. We change and we go on. That's the dream. the dream. The dream fulfilled is really when it comes to the next generation. The dream fulfilled is when it gets to a place where they couldn't see around the bend and see what was coming, but we get to see it. We are the dream fulfilled. So tonight, as we hold our annual meeting, I want us to think of ourselves as the dream fulfilled. This is the community that the founders of the synagogue hoped to create. They didn't know what it would look like. They didn't know who we would be. They didn't know how we would pray together. They didn't know the kinds of actions we would take together. But they had this dream that something wonderful would come out of it. And we are that dream. And our job here today is to dream for the people who will come after us, for the people who will join the synagogue after us next year, next decade, God willing, a uh, hundred years hence, there'll be people still joining the synagogue. And we can't imagine what they're going to be like, what dreams they're going to have, what kind of community they're gonna to wanna to build. But we have to dream for them and dream of a community that can change, that can grow, that can take things we long held to be truths and question them and allow ourselves to change, allow ourselves to redefine ourselves. That's, that's what we are here to do tonight. So I want to welcome you all and encourage you all to embrace our status as the dream of those long past and also our status as those who get to dream for those who will come in the future after us. I'm gonna turn it over to our president for a few short more minutes, um, Denise Wolf. I think you might have to unmute yourself, Denise. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. It's so wonderful to see you. When, the, when this happens, I, I feel, um, I feel close and connected, but I feel distant too, because it just makes me want to be next to you and 
shake your hand, which we're not going to probably do much for a long time, but or I'll hug you. But it's so great to see everybody. I think we have 85 participants. Um, we're making history because this is the first annual meeting for GJC that's virtual and on Zoom. So welcome everybody. Um, we're going to try to keep this till nine o'clock and we have a lot to cover. So I'm going to turn it over to Executive Director Nina Peskin. Thank you for joining us. Um, so if Tina Robinson is on and um, am I muted or unmuted? It looks like, okay, great, thank you. Um, if Tina Robinson is here, which I think she is, um, she will be helping me in going through our annual report, um, which I am really thrilled to share with you. Um, so I am going to, uh, I'm going to go through it now. First of all, I want to thank a lot of people. I want to thank Rabbi Zeff, um, my work partner, who I am so grateful for uh, every day, for his vision and his strength and his uh, commitment to this synagogue. I want to thank Rabbi Richmond for all that she brings, all the um, gifts that she's brought in this last um, year that we've been working with her, to Denise Wolf, who's been just an incredible president to work with, to our executive committee, who are so committed to this, uh, this community and have wrestled with such complicated issues um, with such earnestness and integrity, to our board, who've done the same, to our incredible staff, and to each of you, every member of this community, because we are this year with all its crazy challenges has still been one to really hold up as a as a success it has been full of engagement and meaning and that is because of each of you so thank you so much um, and before I go further I also want to um, I just want to give a special thank you to Rebecca Paquette who helped me put together this report so I'm very grateful to Rebecca for her her work. She's a very quiet staff member. You might not have gotten to know her, but she works very hard and she is, she is a real gift to our staff. So if you have not had a chance to view the report since it was mailed out yesterday, I'll just give you an overview of how it's structured. So it begins with communication from our leadership, from Denise, our president, and from, from Rabbi Steff. And um, then it goes into a bunch of different ways of showing information about the individual people who make up our congregation, our activities, and the impact that GJC has made this past year, and our budget. So there is, um, we've kind of divided the report as our year has been divided into these two segments of um, pre-COVID and post-COVID. And I'm going to focus more in this report on the post-COVID impact and activities, which I hope will illustrate how we have served you, our community, during this time. Um, and I'm hope, I hope you're able to read in greater detail all of the sections of the report because it's really, it brought me a lot of joy and pride to see what we've put together this year. So um, here are some highlights from the COVID period. So, Tina, I'm going to ask you to, I'm looking at my notes, so um, if you could focus on the, um, on that page that shows that. Um, here are some highlights. <clears throat> we had eight different services offered on Zoom with 383 different people, otherwise known as unique users, but I like to think of those users as different people, who tuned in. 3,796 times. So that, that number was put together a couple of weeks ago when this report was being finalized. So it's obviously grown since then. We may be approaching or have exceeded 4,000 times that people have tuned in to connect with us. So you are engaging with us. And because of that, our community remains strong and vi vibrant, even when we are unable to gather physically. Um, 31 volunteers and staff made 546 outreach calls to our members within the first few weeks of the quarantine. 
And of those calls, so we, we contacted 100% of our membership. We actually connected with uh, over 80% of those members. We had to leave messages for some. We had a volunteer who we'll be talking about in a little bit who delivered about 100, 100 cedarine to people so that our members could participate in services. Five clergy and mental health professionals formed a pastoral care team to serve the needs of our community and launched nine support groups focusing on various needs that we have. And just on a more personal note, we've received many emails from congregants offering thanks and praise for what we're doing during this time, for getting online so quickly and with so much to opportunity to engage. Um, what was most notable for me was the theme that came through those emails, which was that our members, some of them said they didn't realize the importance that GJC held in their lives until this period of quarantine. So we're really honored and grateful to remain such an important part of your lives. Um, and then Tina, if we could flip over to the page that refers to the budget. Um, so we're currently projecting a large surplus for the current fiscal year of, I spoke to Gloria today to confirm this, our finance director of $225,700 because we received um, and are going to ask forgiveness of the PPP loan. Um, without that, we would not have made this year's budget because we, during the quarantine period, the executive committee made the very generous decision not to charge families ECP tuition during the period of time that we were closed. Um, but we did receive the small business loan, which is amazing, and we are in good shape for this year. So we do, we are ending on a really strong note with a significant surplus, which is fantastic. However, when we're looking ahead, we don't know what the future holds for the coming year, how our membership dues and giving might be affected by this time and by people's individual circumstances. And therefore, we've budgeted for a deficit of $127,000. So while we should and can really celebrate the successful close of this fiscal year, we are also counting on each and every one of you to bring us through this uncertain time. So I'm going to, again, thank you. This, we, we have so much to be thankful for and to hold up as a success this year. You are an incredible community and you make this community what it is and i hope that you enjoy diving deeper into the report and i thank you i thank you for being a part of this and i thank you for your commitment to this community and that's it for me <laughs> Nina, thank you so much for that um, top-notch annual report. I think this is the second or third year you've done it. Second? And it's incredibly competent, informative, comprehensive, professional. It just, um, it's fabulous. So thank you so much for that. It's, a, it's We're fortunate to have you and have you do that. Did you want to take a moment and talk a little bit about ECP enrollment now, or do you want to do that later? I can do that, sure. Um, so, yes. So, in terms of enrollment, um, Denise asked me to focus on camp um, because camp is really all that we can talk about with any kind of certainty right now. Um, although our numbers for fall, I will say, are looking good. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> um, but specifically for camp. Um, so, historically, camp has uh, we we considered ECP camp a success if it would break even. However, in the last few years, we have we have done significantly better than that, which is great. This year, we were really uncertain uh, until just a couple of days ago. And I want to say to to everybody, everyone, Gloria Geisler, our finance director, has been working so hard, calculating and recalculating and recalculating our camp projections. So I'm very grateful to her. And thanks to 
Michelle Bernstein, our new and amazing ECP director, who's been paying very close <laughs> attention to our staffing needs, making sure that we have perfect, adequate staff to take care of our children beautifully and no more than is absolutely necessary. Um, so because of her attention to that detail and her care for the bigger picture of how ECP serves the needs of Germantown Jewish Center, and we need that, that mini business within our organization to provide us with, with a surplus, um, we, we're coming in okay. So we had originally budgeted for camp to have a surplus of $42,000. We're not going to have that this year, but we are going to have a camp surplus of $22,000. So this is really considering where we could have been with COVID, um, having any kind of surplus and not having a loss or break even, even is really something to be very grateful for uh, the timing of that and, and, uh, and to celebrate. So that is the news from camp. Thank you, Nina. That is really great news. Um, we didn't even know if we would be opening camp this summer. Um, so we'll take that. We'll take that surplus. And um, we're also thinking ahead about the fall. And as Nina said, we can't predict enrollment, but I think it's, it's going um, better than we expected. So we'll keep our fingers crossed for that. Uh, next on the agenda, if I'm correct, is the financial report. And I'm going to give a brief introduction and then turn it over to Steve Levin, who is our treasurer and he's also on the finance committee. So Nina covered a lot of it in the annual report and I just want to emphasize certain points. We are financially sound, which is great, but I want to say for now. Um, so we can pat ourselves on the back and we are, but it, a lot is dependent on the future. Um, enrollment in C ECP, what's our revenue going to be like that from that? What our um, what our needs are, what our our what the how our dues collection goes, how our high holiday appeal goes. So that's all really on the forefront of our minds. And um, we're hoping that we can sustain the synagogue and all the programming and all the staff, but obviously it depends on the the members and their their abilities and generosity so um we are financially sound for now uh, as nina explained we did s secure a sba forgiveness loan of three hundred fifty thousand. we are allowed to use that through june 30th to pay our payroll our staff as well as our utilities so that was good and we you know we were able to do that without touching and dipping into our reserves um, the executive committee and the finance committee really wrestled with what to do for a budget. Um, I'm told the last time uh, delaying a budget was when the, um, the building years ago had a fire and um, we were uncertain about the budget. But we decided to go ahead and um, make a budget, pass a budget, and um, knowing that it would need to be recalibrated as we as our situation evolved um, it's so hard to plan for the future with so many unknowns um, especially with respect to ecp and that type of enrollment and revenue that it will come in and we're also as we said worried about dues collection and high holiday appeal um, so like many institutions synagogues We've been reading in the paper from the Please Touch Museum to the Franklin Institute, everybody's, the Jewish History Museum, everybody's having to make very tough decisions. And we may have to at some point, maybe not, hopefully not, but it depends. Um, we may have to reduce programming, reduce staff. We want to avoid that as much as possible because it's really important that when things open up that our synagogue and our staff, all of whom are very crucial to the running of this organization is available and ready to run when we, op when we open up, um, physically open up. Um, but we did pass a budget because the bylaws required us to. And the budget, and Steve will talk more about this, but it makes a lot of assumptions. And one of those assumptions is that um, ECP is open and that we will um, have it in full enrollment 
So what we're going to do, what we're pledging is the executive committee will be meeting in closer intervals throughout the summer and as well as the finance committee so we can make decisions in a more responsive manner as we go along. The good news is our endowment is strong. Our operating reserves are over 500,000. So we are financially sound for now. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Levin. Thank you. So the problem with following Nina and Denise is that um, they've said most of what I plan to say. Um, I have all these notes. Um, I think that, so the, the big numbers are that at the end of the year, um, right now we have, um, at the end of April, our net income was 31,000 more than we expected to see. Um, and as Nina said, we have a projected surplus at the end of the year of $225,000. Um, the good news is that at the, at the end of the year, we should have operating reserves of $748,000. And, and that's a great number um, because our deficit as we project it for the next year is $127,000. And that's a lot of money. And that's not a sustainable number for us going forward. Um, and in anticipation of this and, and because there's so much uncertainty going forward, um, I think Dan Livney, our incoming president, has wisely suggested that our executive committee meet over the summer. We'll be meeting in July and August. Our finance committee, which has recently been only meeting in times to plan the budget um, in the spring, we'll be meeting again right after the high holidays. We'll have a much better idea then of what the story with COVID is, what the story of our finances are, and we'll make adjustments as we need to. Um, as Denise alluded to, this is not a sustainable uh, number, and we may have some hard decisions to make going forward, but for where we are right now, I think we can feel comfortable. We've done a, a great job in getting here, and we'll just uh, navigate the, the difficult times, these interesting times as we go forward. Thank you, Steve. Steve is uh, the brains on the finances. He understands all those spreadsheets and we're very grateful for his service. Thank you very much. Um, so one thing, we have a lot of uncertainty in our future with respect to our finances, but one thing we are certain about, which is um, who to give the Congregant of the Year Award to this year. It was really an easy decision because um, while we have so many committed members and, and dedicated, hardworking congregants, one stood out above the rest, and that is Mark Minsky. Mark, can you wave so everybody can see you? Um, there's Mark. He's at the bottom of my screen, but I can see him. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of a background on Mark and why we chose him, but most people don't even need it because anyone who knows him knows he's most deserving. Um, he is a published author. Many, many folks I think on this, uh, in this meeting have read his book. He's an expert in CDFIs, Community Development Finance Institutions, where um, organized his progressive money and leverage funds for people's benefit, all the time awarding investors. So he's very knowledgeable. And with that, we put him to good use. Um, but Mark and his partner, Jennifer Paget. Jennifer, did I pronounce that right? Paget. Paget. Jennifer and Mark joined our community. They moved here, I think in 2014, they were in Bucks County. They came to Philadelphia, Mount Airy in 2016. And um, that's kind of amazing. That may be a record because that's the shortest window of the recipient of a congregant of the year to, to, to obtain during a, a short period of being a member of our community. But uh, Mark wasted no time. He became a, a beloved member of Minion Dorshay Derrick, and he serves in the Dorshay leadership. And I asked some of his friends in Dorshay for a few words about him, and they were all glowing, no surprise. Uh, Dale Friedman called, called him an amazing facilitator. He makes everyone feel heard and valued. 
He's a person of vision, imaginative, competent, and reliable. And Beth Janice also observed that Mark always wants to grow Jewishly, and he works hard to expand his Jewish knowledge. He studies Hebrew, Davin's daily, attends Dorsche weekly, and other Jewish classes. This is the, these are the words I really like, that he is a model for continuing, continuing growth and deepening of his Jewish knowledge. So as already has been noted, he is such a mensch. During the pandemic, early on when we were transitioning to this Zoom online reality, um, congregants needed their, their CDOR and Mark up took it upon himself to figure out who needed them. And he drove around Mount Airy, Chestnut Hill, I don't know where else he went, probably all over the city. And he hand delivered from a distance, from a safe social distance, delivered um, Sador to all the congregants in need. And that was such an unbelievable gift to all of us. And um, when I heard about his investment prowess and his financial capabilities, I asked him to review our finances at the synagogue and review our investment investments that haven't been looked at closely by any members for quite some time and how we are doing with Vanguard. He partnered up with some other folks and he took the lead and reviewed all our documents, reviewed all our accounts, met with and talked with Gloria and then made his recommendations to the executive committee, which were very helpful and which we plan to execute in the coming year. So, um, and he's just such a delight to work with. He's humble as can be, and he's responsive and professional and just a joy to have around. So um, we all, our whole community, thanks you, Mark, for agreeing to accept this Congregant of the Year Award. And we're thrilled to have you here with us in our community. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> Thank you, Denise, and thank you to the board for, for honoring me. I appreciate it. It's humbling um, to receive this recognition because so many people at GJC are doing so much to keep the community strong, to keep programs robust, keep finances sound, and keep services engaging and meaningful. When, um, when Jennifer and I moved to Northwest Philadelphia in 2016, joining a synagogue was on our list, but it wasn't at the top of our list. It wasn't all that high on our list. Um, until one, uh, one evening over dinner, Dina Abramowitz and Naomi Clayman encouraged us to check out GJC, and particularly Dorsche Derek, and they did it in true GJC spirit. Um, Come try Dorsche Derek, they said. We think you'll like it. But if you don't like it, try the charity. Try Masorti. And if none of them are right, they said, there are lots of other synagogues around. But as it happened a few weeks later, Dorshe had us at Shalom. I was raised in a minimally observant home. Just before I was born, my parents had a falling out with the rabbi at a time when they reached out for crisis care and he came asking for building funds. And so my participation in organized Judaism ended before it began, or so I thought. But at Dorshe and within a short time at GJC, we belonged. We quickly came to appreciate the extraordinary teaching and the inspiring and deep commitment to Tikkun Olam. It felt easy to belong actively, to do whatever we could to contribute to the community. All around us, we experienced people giving their time and their expertise and their efforts. We were carried in by the spirit of community. Now at 62, I'm experiencing what being Jewish feels like. I feel the rhythm of the Jewish calendar. I hum Jewish melodies absentmindedly on walks, and I feel the draw of Torah. I'm wearing a kippah at home, and on those rare occasions I go out in public, and if you really want to know why I was so eager to go out and deliver all those sidorim, it was so I could go out. But it was good to meet people. And so for the first time, I find myself actively belonging in Judaism. It feels right, and it feels good, because the, the things that GJC cited in honoring me are the things that I now know belong in my life. So I'm grateful to be recognized as GJC's Congregant of the Year, but I believe this award is meant to celebrate everyone who volunteers, who lanes, who dobbins, who leads, who serves, and who helps in every way at GJC. 
and I'm proud to belong to that honorable group. Toda Raba. Thank you so much for those wonderful words, Mark, that really reflect the great soul that you are and how lucky we are to have you in our community. Um, you're going, if, if we were together, I would be handing you a gift. Um, so you can, well, we're going to get it to you. It's from the little shop. We can pretend I'm handing it to you. Oh, you yeah. have it. There is, it's yeah. delivered. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Jennifer's going to get it. If we, if I talk long enough, she'll be back with it. But, okay. But so a, that is just a small token of our appreciation beautiful. from the little yeah. shop. You don't have to open it now, but you okay. could, you yeah, could and show us all at maybe at the end. So uh, thank you again. Thank you. And maybe you can um, somehow write off all that gas mileage you did, right? Uh, with, for taxes somehow. Nah. <laughs> cool. Look at that gift. Jennifer brought it upstairs with her with her broken arm. She said. Oh no! There we go. Maybe not. There we go. There we go. So this is I don't know if can you see it? Beautiful. Oh, that's beautiful. Enjoy Thank it. You. And it's hopeful because it has eight uh, kiddush cups, and that means I get to invite people over someday for Shabbat. Count me in. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Mark is going to invite the whole community over That's right. at some point. We're, we'll be waiting for it. All right, well, as Mark said, that there's, there's many people um, deserving of recognition. I, just, I decided to make a, a, a list to follow Mark um, um, about some of our unsung heroes in the congregation that I just want to recognize. Um, and these are people who are not officers. They're not chairing a committee or serving on a committee because that would take forever to recognize everybody. They're not our wonderful office staff like Tina, Rebecca, Kate, Kelsey. They're all wonderful. Uh, these are really the people that are behind the scenes that no one really knows what they're doing, but we're really grateful for it. So um, bear with me while I go through this. And with one ca caveat, it's always, nerve-wracking or dangerous to recognize people because you're inevitably going to leave people off the list. So I apologize in advance to anyone I leave off this, this list that I should have mentioned, but if you have a complaint about it, please see Dan Livney, okay? All right, here it goes. I want to say um, Sherman Aronson, everybody always hears his name. He was Congregant of the Year last year but I'd be remiss not to mention him and Herb Addison. They are working behind the scenes to get our building nominated to the National Register through the National Park Service and the Department of the Interior. So they're doing a lot of that work, which will benefit all of us. Devira Siegel, she um, did a lot of negotiating for personnel contracts and her, her contribution was invaluable. Then we've got some lawyers I have to thank. David. Um, Kraut, Scott Godshaw, Chris Levin, they were able to give us legal advice quickly when we needed it without charging us. Saved us lots of money. They did advice for sexual harassment, personnel issues arising during the pan pandemic, and tax consequences for donations and dues and things like that. So we are very grateful to those lawyers. Um, a power couple, Ed Lake and Dina Lake, they are always helping the office staff. They're often there um, stuffing envelopes, organizing, collating, and I understand that Ed is also, um, his presence enables office staff to go off campus, if you will, and um, get some lunch or have some breaks. Uh, Dina was also a major volunteer on the Porn Bash. And now we have a father-daughter team Judd Levingston and Serena Levingston, they organize and lead per KI a vote. Thank you so much for that. 
Um, if you're in the building on a Sunday, you're gonna run into Joan Stern. She's always working at that front desk. And again, is a major contributor to the behind the scenes. Eve Pinkinson. Eve is, um, does the center call. Like, and that is no easy task. Every quarter she has to get busy people to make deadlines and write their articles. And she does it and um, with such patience and proper nudging. And then the final product is something we can all enjoy. Thank you, Eve. I wanna shout out to Maxine Fields. Um, many people know her. She is a child psychologist. And um, she, uh, when we had those hate mongers outside our synagogue on one Shabbat, it impacted a lot of people and especially the children in ECP in the religious school. And Maxine worked with um, Michelle and Ben um, to, to um, what to say to the kids about that incident and how to help them process it. Um, Andrea Jacobs, she's done great work with Pride Shabbat, always a success. Rabbi Freddie Cooper does so much for the synagogue, but I especially want to thank her for behind the scenes work. She's assisted with personnel issues and we're very grateful to that. Um, Peshe Leichter, Naomi Hirsch, Eve Pinkinson, they every year compile our directory, which we need so we can contact each other and call each other and email each other. Again, not an easy task, and we all benefit from that. We had some really wonderful Purim Batch volunteers this year. Um, Connie Katz, as always, um, Della Lazarus, and Ronnie Rubin made her debut, and we are all grateful for Ronnie's uh, positive energy and amazing help. Um, and Jake Fisher, he did another great job as chairing the Purim Carnival. That was, you know, that was, when I think back, one of the last great times we got together as a community. There was so much fun and laughter. And that was right before we, um, the shutdown orders took place. So um, Jake, thank you again for a great send off and a great job for the Purim Carnival. Steve Levin, that guy's everywhere. He's everywhere. He's the high he was the high holiday appeal coordinator. Of course, broke every record um, for the amount we raised. And he was, what I'm told, he does things behind the scenes during the pandemic, helping the office staff. And he was uh, an overall mensch. That's what, that's the word, not my words, other people's words. Um, Maria Polzetti and Judd Levingston, once again, morning minion coordinators and leaders. I wouldn't be true to myself if I didn't do a shout out to my favorite place on earth, the little shop, and all the um, folks that volunteer there, ordering great pro, um, items and working the cash register and making it not only a place where we can purchase things, but we, where we can gather and have joy and laughter and get advice. Um, so thank you to the little shop. And what's already been mentioned, all those who've, um, participated in leading the care teams and the support groups since the quarantine. So those are a lot of the unsung heroes. I know there are more. Thank you all for all the work you do and make this, it takes a village, it takes a community. And we're also appreciative of your work. Um, okay, I am going to move on to the president's report. Um, so, I just want to start off with thanking some people. We, we do a lot of that here because it's well-deserved. Um, I want to thank Rabbi Zeff, Rabbi Richman, and the executive director extraordinaire, Nina Peskin. Um, there's so many things I can say here, um, and there are worthwhile, but everybody has witnessed their seamless transition to the virtual world. And our synagogue, maybe the building was closed, but we never shut down. In fact, our programming took on new heights and our participation soared. And Nina and Rabbi Zeph, I always, I refer to this as the golden age and I truly believe it. They have an incredible partnership and we're all the beneficiaries of that. I couldn't imagine this home with one of them and not the other. 
We need them both. They're always a step ahead. They anticipate what the needs are of members and the congregation and the Minyanim. They started planning for the high holidays months ago. They're juggling so many responsibilities and moving parts and tasks on a daily basis with staff, needs of the congregants, the building, and yet they do it with smiles and sincerity. They still are able to listen, be present when there's needs, um, and they're responsive to all of us. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of this year is that we were able to, one of our biggest accomplishments was to be able to secure a contract with Nina Peskin for another five years. So everybody join me in that happiness. Um, Nina and Rabbi Zaff, without a doubt, are the backbone of this community. They, they are unflappable, they are tireless, and they are true visionaries. Um, on, a personal, on a personal note, I, I, I have enjoyed working with them. I have grown so much and I am a better person because of them. Often I find myself in my professional life and my personal life saying, how would Nina respond to this? Or what would Rabbi say? And it's really been um, a, a, an area of growth for me. Um, so I wanna go on to other highlights. As I said, we're fiscally sound for now. Our membership is stable, which is something that is increasingly incredible, especially um, as people turn away from synagogues nationwide, that seems to be a trend. Um, we have all remained connected despite the virtual world, and we have all enjoyed this, the vibrant programming that's being offered. And, but there's a lot of work to do still. And I know we're in good hands in, with Dan Livney taking the helm as president of the synagogue. But um, where a lot of us see that work is several areas. And I wanna talk about racial justice first. Many of you, many of our congregants are participating in protests right now and advocating, advocating for racial justice these past weeks. We applaud you. By all means, please keep it up. At the same time, we at GJC need to take a hard look inward at ourselves, and we can't pat ourselves on the back too much. We have a lot of Jews of color in our community that have felt marginalized throughout the years. They've shared with many of us um, that they sometimes have felt that they didn't belong, that there's comments by many of us, well-intentioned, like, um, questions that offend them, that are inappropriate, even if it seems benign and well intentioned to us. I attended, um, Dorshe has, Dorshe Derek has been doing a lot of work in this area and they have a program uh, later, I think tomorrow night, and they had the Presser Shabbat dedicated to racial justice. And, um, but just asking questions to a person of color, a Jew of color, like, are you Jewish or where did you learn to daven or how do you know that prayer or I can't believe how well your good your Hebrew is some innocent well-intentioned questions like that um, the, the, the recipient um, it doesn't feel so good and often they have told us that some they're mistaken for maintenance staff so those are that's just an example I think that's the tip of the iceberg of how we have to do better our community Rabbi Zeph gave a wonderful sermon about this last um, Rosh Hashanah, and um, this is our goal. We need, we need more Jews of color in our leadership positions um, to help us approach issues and, and things, budgets, and everything going on in the community with a lens of a Jew of color, how that would look. And... Um, we also need to maybe go outside the community and, and try to actively recruit Jews of color who maybe never felt this was a safe space. So our executive committee has been working hard on that, trying to make GJC an anti-racist community. Um, Anina Peskin's suggestion, we all read a book, White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo, and many of us found it eye-opening and quite humbling 
to recognize that we have implicit bias and we need to do a lot of work every day. We discussed that book throughout the year and um, it was very, it was very helpful. It was a start. Um, also, there's a cultural transformation committee that was formed this past year and it's being co-chaired by Jared Jackson and Latifa DePaolo McLeary and they meet monthly and they provide us, the, ex the leadership, the executive committee, with tools and understandings how to become anti-racist. Anti They've given us some real practical advice and how to go about in our decision making. But the burden's not on them, it's on us as white Jews to make this happen, us individually and us as an institution. And that's what we're about to do and that leads to one of the third things that we're working on. Despite um, the uncertainty for finan our financial situation going forward, the executive committee recently made a decision that we've been, um, we've been planning to hire professional consultants um, in the area of anti-racism. And we sent out requests for proposals and the executive committee and the board approved it. And we identified consultants and we checked their references. We did a lot of due diligence and coordination with the Cultural Transformation Committee. And we were going to wait to start that, uh, to um, be, let them begin, the consultants to begin. We're going to wait because the pandemic and then everything in the wake of the, um, the George Floyd murder, um, we decided we're not going to wait, that the time is now. And so we are trying to get those consultants to start as soon as possible. So stay tuned for that. And I hope to see you at a lot, all of you at a lot of those meetings. So keep up the protesting, keep up the advocacy, and we have a lot of more work to do in our, in our community. Um, so that was one of the big highlights, components of the executive committee's work this year, and it's not done yet. The other one was security. I mean, uh, Pittsburgh, Tree of Life, Synagogue, um, that tragedy is not too far, anti too far, not too long ago, and then followed by Poway, and anti-Semitism across incidents of in anti-Semitism across the country are still rising. Um, and, and frankly, our, you know, our synagogue, we felt we needed to do something in terms of security. And that wasn't an easy decision because we're always welcoming. We all, we're always trying to balance the tension between being a welcoming community and having security. And that's not easy to do. But um, a committee, a security committee was formed. It was co-chaired by Barb Menon and Will Shapiro, who did a great job. Um, Barb did such a fantastic job that she was um, she was asked and agreed to move on to the executive committee. So we're thrilled about that uh, if everybody, if she gets so nominated and approved. Um, and they, they met, this committee was representative of di divergent views from various constituencies in our synagogue and they worked diligently trying to figure this out. It was not an easy task and they didn't always agree, but the conversations and the discussions were thoughtful and respectful. And at the end, they made recommendations to the executive committee, which we absolutely needed and used. And those recommendations we implemented, which was to have a security guard and to have a one entrance. And we also um, organized a security Shabbat and all of that you know, there were definitely some concerns about it and how it would feel and how it would look. Um, there were pros and cons, but we went ahead and we've done that. Now the building's closed, so we're not gathering for Shabbat services, so we're not using the security guards. But um, whether or not, when the time, when the building get, opens up and people are gathering again, the executive committee is poised to revisit the needs of security um, in the future. So it's something that's not permanent, but it's something that we will be looking at an, on an ongoing basis. So that was a big deal this past year for, the, for um, leadership. Um, Steve Levin, yes, his name's popping up again. He's the guy behind the landscape master plan. There is one, we've budgeted for it. Um, we're working on the financing for that. We wanna do a lot of um, landscaping projects in the community. 
uh, for the building in the outside, the parking lot. But again, it depends on our finances, but uh, we're hoping to get to that. And there's also um, a committee of dedicated members worked hard to prioritize building projects. So when, we, when we're ready, we're gonna be able to move forward with that. Um, public statements. That was something that the executive committee has worked hard on this year and the year before. Many of you will served on a committee chaired by Dan Livney and um, that took over a year. And in that year, they did a lot of hard work assessing the needs and desires of the community. They did parlor meetings. Many of you contributed to that. Many of you um, facilitated it and many of you came and shared your views with us. And it all got documented and conveyed to leadership. There were surveys and this was a Herculean task. And ultimately the executive committee and the board approved the, the policy that GJC could and should, when appropriate, issue public statements as vetted and decided by the executive committee. So that was a long time coming. And in the last several months, the executive committee has issued three statements. I just wanna mention them here. Um, the first one was presented to us by a subgroup of the Tikkun Alum Committee. And it, it basically was for um, justice for refugees and asylum seekers. Basically that GJC supports the human rights of all refugees, asylum seekers and immigrants. And it was a very powerful statement that the EC worked on and uh, ultimately issued. More recently, since the pandemic started, um, we, GJC, signed on to a, a statement with many other synagogues, churches, Muslim organizations, Jewish organizations, legal organizations. It was organized by the Anti-Defamation League, and it was a statement condemning bias incidents and hate crimes directed at Asian Americans during the pandemic. And the third public statement that we recently approved um, is to post Black Lives Matter signs outside our building. So if you go, if you drive by Germantown Jewish Center on Lincoln Drive or Ellett Street, you should be able to see this. I just want to um, assure the community that every statement proposal goes through a very deliberate process by our executive committee. We talk about it, we have different views, we can, we make suggestions, we make edits, we can say no. Um, it's not a rushed process. It's something that's very deliberate and sometimes takes a long time. And I just want to thank you all for getting us to this place where we are um, have the protocol and the process to do this in a fair and deliberate manner. I also um, want to highlight some personnel changes in the religious school this year. Um, we will miss Ben Rotenberg. He was the ed very energetic education director who all the kids loved. We're gonna really miss him and we hope to see him around. I've told him that many, many times. Um, but fortunately, ben, and Ben has been very helpful and working to get our new education director up to speed. And with that, I wanna give a hearty welcome to Abigail Abby Weinberg for um, as she joins us as the new education director. We welcome Abby with open arms. She is very well known and, and adored throughout the community. So we're, we're looking forward to um, see, seeing what magic and success she can bring to us all. A um, Couple other things I wanna just say. Um, I had a brain trust. I, I had a lot of help from people throughout this, these two years of my presidency. I needed input often, I needed advice. As Nina referenced, the issues that we wrestled with could be very complicated. And we wanna always make the best decision we can and do it as fair as possible with listening to the concerns of the community. So um, I, there were people I called and I just wanted to thank them. I interrupted so many of their family dinners and it always amazed me that they still picked up the phone for me when I called. And again, lists are dangerous because I know I'm going to forget someone, but I want to thank Chip and Marta Becker for always being there. Dave Masenkis, 
always giving me some thoughtful input. Jared Jackson, really, really helpful. Dan Livney, he always, uh, I always enjoyed his perspective. Matt and Jessica Shapiro, thank you so much. Chris Levin, called her all hours. <laughs> Helen Feinberg, Alex Malat, Dan and Marcy Basine. So thank you all. Um, I wanna take a moment to thank my husband, um, Paul Rudick. Without him, I could not have done this. He's the love of my life. He held up the fort and um, I really always appreciate him. And he helped me with, when, when I couldn't get Steve Levin, he helped me with all the finance stuff. Um, I also wanna thank my kids, Caleb and Noah, because they, uh, they often edited my articles for the center call before I gave them to Eve. And they, they also helped me edit some of my high holiday appeal speeches. Um, and thank you for Levi for, uh, for giving me reason to go to the synagogue on Sunday mornings and Tuesday nights and Wednesdays because he's still involved in all the programming. So thank you for that. Um, again, being president, a lot of people said to me when I became president, congratulations and my condolences. You know what? Looking back over the past two years, I don't need anybody's condolences. These were some, this was one of the best decisions I made in my life. It was so much fun. I grew a lot as a person. I made new friends. Um, the EC, the executive committee, the board, everybody showed up. Everyone was respectful. We wrestled with things. Things got tense, but at the end of the day, we all laughed and we all got along. So I need to thank um, David Hahn. I'm going to do the Davids first. David Hahn, David Fish, David Masenkis, Dan Livney, Chip Becker, Diane Isle, Beth Stearman, and Steve Levin. And lastly, I have to say our beloved Linda Krieger. And there's gonna be more on her in a moment, but um, the EC will never be the same again without Linda. And I will say more on that in a little while. Um, it was a privilege to serve you all. I will treasure handing a Torah to your children or to you when I was on the Bima. I treasure holding your hand at a Shiva and listening to all your ideas, whether they came in by text, email, face-to-face, -face, all your ideas about how to make GJC a better home for all of us. Thank you so much for trusting me and allowing me to manage this very sacred space and community. And with that, the torch will be passed to the installation of the new officers. And I hand the program over to Matt Shapiro. But wait, there's more. Before we go to, to Matthew, we want to take a moment to appreciate you, Denise. And you probably haven't been able to see all the notes in the chat, as but you should look at them. <laughs> uh, because there's so much appreciation so for nice. you coming to you from all the people on this meeting and from the congregation at large. And for me and for Nina, we are so, so grateful to be able to work with you for these two years when we had to face things we never could have imagined at the beginning. And I, you know, I talked earlier about the dreams of the founders and they didn't know that you were gonna be president. You didn't know that you were gonna be president. <laughs> and I know that at the beginning you were like, what am I doing here? How can I possibly serve? What do I have to give? And I think what we all discovered was how much you had to give to this place, how much your wise and thoughtful leadership, your graciousness, your ability to be calm under pressure. We faced some really, really difficult moments and you handled them in a really beautiful and inclusive way. So you were such a model for leadership in our community. And we talk all the time about leadership development, but one of the greatest ways of leadership development is people seeing a model that they can follow. And when you involved everyone in a decision in the executive committee, in the board, in the community, and drew people in and took people's criticism and took people's <laughs> praise and used that in a productive way, both of them. Then you showed the promise that the, the leadership saw in you, the congregation saw in you when they elected you to be our president. And we are so, so grateful that you agreed. We're so, so grateful to, to, to your family, um, to Paul and to the kids for, for agreeing as well and for supporting you and thus supporting all of us. 
And we couldn't have been happier and more fortunate to have you as our president during this time. It always happens that president's terms are not what they expect. Things come out of the blue like a pandemic that we've never seen before in our lives. Um, and you just handled all of it with such skill and grace. And it's wonderful to hear that you grew from it because we grew so much from having you as our leader. So we wanted to give you a gift. And uh, I'm, I think uh, that Tina is gonna be able to share it there. Oh, that, well, <laughs> Tina has, has, a, has a picture of what's inside. Is it okay to share that? Should I open it? Well, or Tina could share the picture. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Tina, do you wanna try to do that? <laughs> Beautiful. Oh my God, look at Shabbat candle holders. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Denise. It's just candles. Thank you've, you. been a, you've been a light in our lives, and we hope this provides light in your household for many, many years to come. Thank you. Yay. You all can't hug her, but I'll hug her for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Matt. Well, you're up. Matt is up and you can take oh. the time to read the chat. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I am going to give my report from the nominating committee. And the first thing I wanna do is, I know we all, Denise just did all those thanks, but I'll do a couple too. Um, the rest of the nominating committee, which was terrific, was Chris Levin, Connie Katz, Akila Shapiro, Maria Polzetti, and Lila Berman. Um, it was a really good committee notwithstanding that we couldn't meet in person. Um, so first, I want to officially discharge all of the people whose terms are ending, starting with um, the board of directors where we are discharging Craig Barkan, Robert Dudnick, Minna Ziskin, although we are renominating her, and Della Lazarus. Um, from the executive committee, I actually want to start with one really important discharge, which is after many, many years of being on the executive committee and serving two years as president and the last two years as the immediate past president, we are actually discharging Chip Becker, who um, will now get to go through what I did two years ago, and of course every president does, which is you no longer have executive committee meetings to go to. It's like a giant hole on your Wednesday. So Chip, we thank you for um, all, of, all of your time devoted to the synagogue. I know you will continue to, to be there um, for Dan and for anyone else who needs you. So thank you, Chip. Um, probably the second most important discharge, of course, is to Denise, who is now discharged in her role as president with our great thanks as shown in the chat. And, and as the rabbi said, um, and, and I was, particularly happy to hear that you enjoyed your two years because, um, you know, Chip and I would have felt really guilty otherwise. <laughs> um, so, Denise, you are now discharged. I will discharge the rest of the folks who have served on the executive committee, which is Dan Livney, David Hahn, Linda Krieger, Zichran Azabrasav, about whom I will say more in a moment, David Musankis, Steve Levin, David Fish, also with a special thank you because David is now rotating off of the executive committee, having served for many, many years on the executive committee and, and been a wonderful part of the conversations and, and um, very helpful. So thank you, David. I don't know if you're here or not. I can't scroll through as quickly. Um, we are also discharging, at least for the moment, Marcy Ross, Diane Isle, and Beth Hearman, which brings me to this year's report of the nominating committee. And so first we are nominating, and I noticed the email was very helpful. It's now too late for anyone to submit any other nominations. So I gather this isn't really an election. It's a nominating and, and, and a putting into position by, by unanimous acclaim or something like that. But so first we will um, install for terms on the board, which will end in 2023. Bill Goldberg, Don, Donald Perlman, Deb White, and Minna Ziskin. And then moving on to the executive committee and, and not even subject to any election or countering nomination, we of course will have Denise moving into the wonderful position of immediate past president, which she will find to be wonderful. Um, the rest of the executive committee that we would like 
to nominate. We are, of course, nominating Dan Livney as president. Um, and really, Dan, I saw a while earlier you had the whole family sitting there. I don't see them anymore, but of course, as has been reflected as we've talked about Denise and her family, we might as well be nominating your entire family because, eh, okay, we got some of them. So you're all nominated for the family role of, of president. Um, we are nominating David Mosankis to be senior vice president. We are nominating David Hahn to be the vice president of education. Um, Linda Krieger, the Colonel of Brassard, rejoined the executive committee in 2014. That was rejoining. She had been there before, but that was actually my first year as president. And, and since then, she has consistently brought her energy and her wisdom and her kindness and her deep understanding of our community among countless other attributes to the executive committee. And when the nominating committee began meeting um, only a few months ago, we were actually debating whether we could meet in person or not at the time. Uh, to give us time and time, time idea. Um, we easily and readily decided to renominate her to the executive committee. And um, as a too small, but nonetheless incredibly um, meaningful to us way of honoring her and all that she's given to the community, we are um, renominating her to the executive committee. So um, we are, pardon me for a moment, um, we are also nominating for the rest of the executive committee slate, Mr. Everywhere, Steve Levin. Um, Jake Fisher, who is joining the executive committee. Barb Menon, who is joining the executive committee. Marcy Ross, Diane Isle, and, and Beth Stearman. So with um, everyone's approval, that is your new slate. And I hereby declare you by power that I have wholly made up, but somehow vested in me to be the new executive committee. Thank you. So um, I just want to say three things. One, Matthew, I want to thank you for chairing the nomination committee this year. You've worked tirelessly doing that, and we're really grateful because we have a great board and a great executive committee going forward, and thank you for all your hard work with that. Um, I was remiss earlier. I forgot to mention Marcy's name. Mar Marcy Ross is somebody on the executive committee that I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to know and working with. Thank you, Marcy. Um, and before we move on to Dan Livney, Tina, can you put up some of those pictures about of photos of Linda again? I just want to say, I want to echo a little bit of what Matthew said. Because um, I just love looking at her. Um, she and I started the executive committee at the same time under Matt Shapiro's presidency six years ago. Like that, she always brings a smile to my face and everybody else. She's going to be dearly missed. Um, when she was on the executive committee, she just would sit at the table. She always showed up. She always volunteered. Denise seems to have frozen. Mm. I, I think we're going to have to go on. Hopefully Denise will be join us. Oof. Okay. Um, Dan. There you are. I'm on? You're on. I'm on. Okay. I was going to say a word to, to Denise, but 
That'll wait. Hopefully she'll be back. Erev Tov. I'm grateful uh, to have been nominated for the role of president of GJC. You already know that this is a special place, and I'm uh, deeply honored to be able to serve the synagogue in this way because it is such a special place. Melissa and I first came here looking for a synagogue and a community to connect with in 2010. We had our first child shortly thereafter, and it has nurtured me and my family since then. Both of my children had their bris here. They go to religious school here. My oldest Boaz has been a devoted Bagel Cafe volunteer. And my youngest Ezra, that bottomless well of energy. Well, if you haven't yet run into Ezra, chances are at some point, once the lockdown is over, he will run into you. My connection actually has uh, somewhat even longer roots as my father Aaron and his wife Ina were members here uh, for many years before we joined. And I used to visit the synagogue with them back before I knew that I was shopping for a shul. This place has given me and my family a lot and I think of entering into this role in part as a way of giving something back. So thank you for placing your trust in me in this way. Uh, trust, of course, is key. Over my years on the executive committee, I have wondered from time to time, what manner of governance do we engage in here at the synagogue? We are not quite a democracy and certainly not quite a theocracy. What perhaps we are closer to and how I have come to think of our style, and I needed to coin a word to describe it as a trustocracy. Everything that happens in this building depends on the idea of trust. And whether we are seen as succeeding or not is defined by the extent of our ability to maintain it with you. Our efforts at transparency and including as many voices who represent as many different parts of the community as we can, and every decision that the EC makes are all things that are meant to build and keep your trust because that is the cornerstone and I have no higher aspirations for my term than that. I agreed to this nomination about a year ago, and then this happened. I find myself in the position of beginning my work as president in the midst of trouble and heartache. What we have seen and experienced over the last several months is not something that any of us had imagined. I know they say that every presidency has its challenges, and I had prepared myself for you know, a small fire, maybe a flood, perhaps some construction issues, but this is where we are. Back in March, when the lockdown first began, Boaz asked me a fascinating question. He said, when should I start to feel worried? Parents will readily recognize this as one of those questions that has so much rich potential for the start of an educational opportunity and a meaningful interaction that they will probably get wrong. I told him that he must already be feeling worried, otherwise he wouldn't have asked the question. I tried to validate his feelings. Said it was entirely uh, understandable that he would be feeling this way. And as, uh, as predicted, uh, that went nowhere. Um, I thought about the question some more and after a few more attempts that Boaz also roundly, roundly notified me were not what he was looking for, I came up with the following. Perhaps the question that we might want to think about is not when should we start to feel worried or hurt, but what do we do with these feelings when we have them? Because in times such as these, feelings come as needed, appropriate if not always welcomed messengers, to let us know when shadows have come knocking on our doors. When we feel hurt or worried, I said to Boaz, do we see it as a signal of terrible things to come and that there's nothing we can do? Or do we see it as a sign that something is wrong to pay attention and to decide if we need to do something about it? Worry and pain have knocked on our community store loudly over the last three months. In quick and ruthless succession, we have collectively experienced a series of shocks, a pandemic and physical distancing and all of its consequences. We have witnessed a modern day 
public lynching on the streets of an American city, an upheaval following, and for some, and more intimately, the untimely loss of a beloved GJC member, Linda Krieger. And then at the time that I was writing these words, many of us were getting over the effects of the blackouts following a sudden violent storm, how much more. At the same time that all of this was going on, I've witnessed something else. I have seen astonishing energy arising from within the synagogue. Rabbi Zeph working around the clock and showing his technological chops in the service of maintaining community at morning minion, Shabbat morning services, conferring with B'nai Mitzvahs rescheduled and rethought and really too much more to go into here, only to say that he has been working overtime. I think we know that and we are deeply grateful. Additionally, GJC has offered I have 63, apparently up to 87 different types of virtual services. Pro the place just moves too quickly. Program support groups and classes. Beit Midrash calls him out with pride and racial justice. The Minyanim have been finding their own ways to connect and pastoral care team making calls to almost every single member of the community and gathering mental health professionals and establishing weekly support meetings. The religious schools reinventing itself online under Ben Rotenberg's guidance, which has we heard is now in the midst of being handed over to Abby Weinberg. Thank you, Abby. Mark Pinsky, thank you, Mark. Driving the neighborhood to make sure everyone who needs it has a prayer book. The weekly Havdalah hosted by the family retreat families, the hundreds of people coming together on Zoom to grieve Linda and to support one another following the tragic murder of George Floyd. Rabbi Richmond has been a tremendous asset and Nina Peskin as always standing ably behind the scenes when she's not singing in front of them to allow all of this incredible energy to find its flow. And now we're on the National Register. What, I can't write this fast enough. This place just is always something happening. This has been a community that in the midst of crisis has done what this community has always done, which is that when hurt and loss and fear come to call, we roll up our sleeves and we take care of each other in ways that make me feel that as daunting as our challenges are and are perhaps likely to be for the foreseeable future, we are in as good of a position as we can possibly be to weather the many storms that seem to keep coming. There are many reasons for this, but first and foremost, it is because of the love and energy and caring that all of you have shown in the most difficult of times. What I told Boaz that day in March reflects everything I have seen in GJC at its best. So am I worried? Yes, and scared, and I feel the hurt. But I take strength from each and every one of you, as I know that you do from each other. And when I say that our goal is to build trust, what that means foremost is to work at listening and hearing the voices of need within our own community and to respond to them as best as we can, because if we fall down at hearing the voices that cry out with needs from within our virtual walls, then what chance do we have to hear those who cry out from without? So that is where we are. And so while in some ways so much seems to have changed, other things have not. Uh, what has not changed is what our values are, community, transparency, inclusion. Some of our members Remember when this building was but a twinkle in the eye of an, of an architect with a quirky sense of humor. Others are newer or have experienced special challenges in feeling connected to the community. Blackouts, pandemics, all else aside, our goals and values haven't changed, only our tools might. Zoom and all of its video conferencing friends has become ubiquitous. As a psychologist, I am more used to speaking to people one-to-one -one speaking in front of audiences is not part of my day job. In fact, when my name first came up, I asked Denise and Chip and Matt and Chris and Helen, Hirsch, Vera, David, Jim, Dan, Abe, and Paul to make sure that someone not trained as a lawyer could take on this role. They checked the bylaws, exclaimed something in Latin, and then came to the conclusion that they thought it would be okay. I in turn asked them how they felt about me doing this job. They still seem to be fine with it. Next, I started toying with the idea of delivering the Kol Nidre address one congregant at a time privately as I am used to doing my day job. That idea turned out not to be practical. So obviously 
for me, challenges remain. What I do have as I enter into this role in the midst of all of this heartache is, is all of you. It's the only reason I agreed to take this on, and it's the only reason I have to believe that while we know we don't have any control over what worries knock at our door in the night, we know that taking care of each other and of the community is what we have in order to get through. Um, I wanted to <laughs> wanted to thank Denise. Is she back? I don't know. She is back. Oh, good. Denise, um, you're great. And you didn't have to be this great. Um, <laughs> did you have to be that great? Uh, but you've left me very stylish shoes to fill and we'll see what happens. I, I have to say that my uh, uh, being president of a shul is really almost nowhere on my, on my resume. So we'll see what happens. It was good to hear from, from Adam that uh, she, was, uh, she had some uncertainty about entering this role. So, um, but you really have um, been a steady hand and a, a really an amazing uh, cheerleading voice for the EC, for the synagogue. Uh, a great role model uh, for me uh, as I enter into this role. And, uh, and you have a style of leadership that I imagine I will always uh, envy, even as I have to find my, my own. Um, I look forward to working arm in arm with EC and with all of you, as always, on doing the work of the community. Uh, thank you and wishing you all good health. And Lila Tov. Thank you, Tam. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there's a little more. I know it's getting late. Dan, thank you for those wonderful words. We have no doubt you're going to carry the, this synagogue to new heights, and we're all going to be there behind you. Um, sorry for my disruption earlier. It was a government computer. I switched to my iPad, so we're all good. Um, there's one little surprise or one more thing we want to show. It's a video of all of the um, executive committee that will be on the executive committee next year. Um, all the returning members, aside from Chip, he's not returning, but he's on the video. So mm -hmm. we're going to roll this little thing out right now. Can't hear him. Uh oh. So, mm -hmm. Tina, you need to um, click on more under share screen and share the computer sound. Start it over. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're going to start it again. Take two. <laughs> Executive Committee of DJC wishes you good health and happiness until we can all be together again. Well done. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> uh, another brainchild of Denise Wolf. Yay, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, folks. Yeah. <laughs> we've, 
we have come to the end of our annual meeting and it's been a really wonderful one um full of laughter and tears and i wanted to just say one word before we go and it's inspired by by two people um first of all by uh rabbi gordon because rabbi gordon would always say to me when we were working together that it would be easy to be working at a synagogue where we did the same thing every year. But what makes it challenging and exciting to work at GJC is that we reinvent ourselves every year. <laughs> every year we're doing something different. Every year we're reimagining who we wanna be and where we wanna go. And of course, he didn't know then about what was gonna happen this year, but this is just another example of where we take everything we've done before and put that in a file somewhere and then do something completely different in this year. So that spirit of reinvention all the time has served us well over all of our history. And it certainly served us well in this period and God willing, it's going to serve us well in the future. And the other person I wanna to remember tonight is, um, is, is Kranzel, who unfortunately just died this morning. And Judge Kranzel uh, was, uh, was a member of the synagogue um, almost his entire life. Uh, his parents were really active members of the synagogue, and he had this wonderful sense of the history of the synagogue and all of the risks that the synagogue had taken over many years uh, from Rabbi Cherry to Rabbi Han. And he would remind me of them all the time. At Kiddush, he would want to come talk to me about a contemporary issue and how we needed to take a risk around this issue, just as Rabbi Han had taken risks in his time, just as Rabbi Cherry had taken risks in his time. And so I want to honor Iz and his belief in us that we can keep taking risks, we can keep changing, we can keep challenging ourselves and reinventing ourselves. That is really what we were put here to do. That was the dream that we are now living out. And I want to offer us the blessing that we continue to have the strength to do that and to believe, to believe in our future. Sometimes it's hard to believe in a future that's all about change and yet that's our past and God willing, that's always gonna be our future. So may we all be blessed with that, the faith in our power to change and our power of reinvention. And may we all go forward and have a wonderful year together in community, however we find it in this time that we could never have expected. Erev Tov to everybody. Thank you all for coming here. I'm gonna unmute us all so we can all say, Bye or shalom or something like that. Shalom, oh, oh, shalom. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much, everybody. Oh, shalom. 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 Congratulations, Dan. Yes, Dan. Good luck. Great job. Great job tonight, Dan. Great job, Dan. Great job, Dan. It was really quite a wonderful Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. annual meeting. Thank you for introducing